Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for listening to uh, this talk and for participating in this capacity building uh, session. My name is Evelina Trutnevita, and I'm at the University of uh, Geneva. And I would like to speak about the uh, various approaches, but also the work that we have been doing in terms of uh, model validation. And what I in particular like about uh, this capacity building session is its focus on renewable energy, because for those who have, uh, of us who have been in this field for some time, we're just um, no way too many cases where um, renewable energy projections uh, that come from models or renewable energy scenarios have run, have gone, um, uh, well, uh, simply wrong. And here I, um, I, I would like just to show this case of solar photovoltaic. It's a known, known case, of course. Then um, solar photovoltaic started growing globally in the year 2000. The International Energy uh, Agency's outlook has actually foreseen that this growth rate, um, so capacity additions per year, would stay all the way until 2030. And yet, of course, as we know, solar photovoltaic has the growth has accelerated uh, rapidly. And yet every year it was seen that um, now these capacity additions per, per year um, are going to um, uh, flatten out. And of course, today's reality is somewhere completely off of this uh, track. And here solar photovoltaic is just one example of multiple uh, technologies that have seen this mismatch between the reality and uh, um, the modeled uh, scenarios and modeled projections. So now what, what we can do to improve the models and to evaluate uh, them for, um, for, for their usability. So in my view, the state of the, uh, state of the art approach is to use multiple methods. And here I'm using the work of, of Charlie Wilson uh, and, and colleagues. And I will ask the organizers of this capacity building session to upload this as additional reading for you. And actually what these authors have done um, is a framework for integrated assessment models of climate change. Um, and reflecting on the various evaluation criteria uh, that are relevant. For example, um, whether the model is um, good for its purpose and it's um, consistent with the research question to answer, or whether it's a, um, let's say, good enough for, for, for the purpose of that the users want to use it for, as well as modelers. And then for each of these criteria, there, of course, there are various methods that are available to evaluate the models such as, so some of them are based on looking at the past observations like historical simulations and um, checking if the models meet, match the historical generalizable patterns or so-called uh, stylized facts. But there's also, of course, a lot that can be done by comparing the, the different models like conducting model intercomparison projects or um, diagnostic uh, indicators. And each of these methods has its strengths and weaknesses when it comes to these different evaluation criteria, meaning actually if we really want to have a multi, the most comprehensive evaluation of the models, we should um, uh, combine these different methods where, where uh, possible to um, ensure the, the validation. Now, in, in today's uh, talk, what I will mostly speak about is actually this example of historical simulations and how they can be used, because I believe that this is an, um, the area where we as a community do a little bit too little to, to benefit uh, for, for our models. Um, now, in, in this particular case, I'll use uh, an example of an energy systems model or technology rich energy systems model. So it's the kinds of models that that represents the energy system from resources all the way in, uh, to the demand. And it has a detailed technology rep representation. 
and it eventually um, uses cost optimization um, as a, a way to come up with a result, for example, like this, uh, which would be a cost optimal scenario from one year uh, for the next, let's say, 20 years and how the, um, in this case, electricity sector uh, mix could, electricity generation mix could uh, evolve. And I'll come back later on to this graph. So just to say, I'll, I'll speak about the energy system models primarily, although many of these insights apply to integrated assessment models as well, because I think about a half of integrated assessment models are also based on uh, cost optimization. Now, the question here is why do we cost, cost optimize at all? And uh, if we look uh, back, it's actually ever since we, um, we invented this concept of a mathematical ability to cost optimize in the early 1900s, it became a well-established approach in math, mathematics, and in management science, and so on. But actually, even as an idea, and these words uh, to minimize or to maximize, um, come even from, from earlier time from Jeremy Bentham, who actually at the time thought that it's uh, meaningful to um, minimize uh, societal suffering and to maximize the uh, societal well being, for example. And then when we kind of take, so this, we are very well familiar intuitively even with these concepts. When we take the example now of energy system models, the two um, arguments why um, we use cost optimization typically. So the first argument or approach is a so social planners uh, approach, which assumes that um, you know in a model we uh, kind of we represent this single decision maker that seeks to maximize the social welfare for for the society as a whole. And in this way, it's, it's represented by this cost optimal solution. Although in reality, we know that um, such um, decision makers do not really uh, exist and we have multiple actor, uh, actors um, acting in the system. The another, uh, another argument that is actually closely interlinked with the first one is the partial uh, equilibrium argument that says that supply and demand equilibrium is reached when the total surplus is uh, maximized, which is equivalent to minimizing uh, total system cost. And yet in the case of energy system models, we know this is just a partial equilibrium uh, um, models, meaning that interactions with many other sectors outside the, the energy system are actually not covered and they could, again, so to some extent this cost optimization um, reasoning works, but perhaps not fu fully. Um, fully. Um, could energy transition be uh, not cost optimal? Well, there's, um, I think many of us would agree that it, it can and that it is. We have, of course, bounded rationality. So first of all, that uh, what is the rational and what is utility um, of the different actors is defined, of course, um, differently by these actors, but also there are all kinds of deviations in terms of um, not being able to make uh, fully rational decisions. There are multiple unmodeled objectives and transition drivers that uh, we simply cannot or do not uh, represent in the models. And anyway, energy system is such a complex system that it's difficult to steer it to, to the single point of, of cost optimality that, uh, that we would like to. And there are of course many other reasons why um, energy models may, so why uh, cost optimization might actually not be quite a good proxy for the real world uh, transition. And this is something that actually we um, uh, looked at through the perspective now of historical model modeling, historical simulation to understand um, and evaluate and improve uh, our, our model. So in this case, I'm, I will be using the expanse model, which is, it has the structure of a typical bottom-up technology rich cost optimization model. So very similar structure like many other models. 
In addition, it also explores near optimal solutions of, of, the, model, uh, of the model, and that I will explain later on. It uses also Monte Carlo technique for parametric uncertainty. And in the, today's talk, I'll, I'll mostly focus on the retrospective uh, application of, of this model as a validation um, approach. And so what, what in the study that I will show, I'm uh, looking into the UK, United Kingdom's electricity generation mix and its evolution since 1990 until uh, 2014. Uh, assuming that the um, uh, electricity demand is given exogenously, so that means it's all only about the um, uh, kind of calculation of the of, um, electricity generation mix. And so what I did in this case, I really pretended as if I, I'm living in the year 1990. And actually, but do have foresight on the actual historical data that will come, come to be. So for example, actual electricity demands, but also which plants retired when, what were the costs and technology characteristics and, and so on. So it means it's kind of the situation where I assume I live in 1990, I set up this model, but I by chance guess, excuse me, <coughs> Yes, all the model parameters, right, which means I uh, eliminate this uh, parametric uncertainty in, in this model. Now, the first uh, run of, of this expanse model is like in any model, a cost optimization. And in this case, I uh, first of all show you deterministic run, meaning there's really these, the parameters from the historical model, uh, from the historical data, um, fed into the model and um, to eliminate the, the parametric uncertainty. And so the cost optimal output of, of cost optimal scenario of uh, this model would be um, like this. Basically it would show that the, um, the technologies from the nineties like coal and um, gas, but also nuclear would stay and, and basically be um, uh, constitute the main part, the majority of the electricity mix by the year 2014. Now, if we compare this with the reality, we of course see a very um, uh, quite uh, some mismatch. For example, in the UK, there was um, combined cycle gas turbines here have um, um, gr grown faster than actually in the foreseen in, in the um, cost optimal model, but also later on the, the of course climate change concerns and so on the um, new so renewable technologies like wind power and, and biomass have also uh, taken off, which is not at all um, included in, in, in the cost optimal uh, scenario. And while this is perhaps not so surprising, you know that because we cannot. Um, you know, use a model to really predict this. Um, so precisely the composition of the um, of the future energy system. What is more thought provoking is if we actually look what happens with the total system costs. And here, well, um, the total uh, cumulative system costs in, in the model period are shown. shown. And the black line here represents this cost optimal solution. So meaning the, the model's cost optimal solution. And the, the gray line here shows the cost of the real world. Um, if it would be implemented in the model, it means it's full, fully comparable. And we can see that actually there's this consistent deviation from cost optimal um, solution in terms of cost that by the end leads to a 16% higher cumulative system cost. So that means, um, how to say, that, that um, in the UK, the transition has consistently followed this um, path that was not cost optimal. One could ask, of course, is it a matter of discount rate? So also by increasing the discount rate, we still uh, can see that there will be a, um, a, a um, still deviation from this cost optimal path. 
Uh, why so? So I, I have mentioned already this case of the climate change that, that started the renewable energy growth that could have not been uh, anticipated in the year 1990. But there's also some, something else. So I showed this case of the uh, combined cycle gas turbines that grew faster than in cost optimization model. And actually when, when doing the study, I also looked at the historical reviews of, of the UK energy policy. And actually here, for example, we, I, I found that, um, so at the time it, uh, in the nineties, UK was undergoing the market liberalization and the regulator was keen to have new um, uh, players enter the market to promote competition, which was actually, um, which meant um, kind of improving the, the conditions for the combined cycle turbines, which was the novelty of the time, the new technology of the time to enter the market. And actually at, at that time, this was, this is a quote from this, um, from this review, that this was already known as a controversial decision because there was evidence that new um, gas turbines would be more expensive than let's say the coal plants that they were replacing. And nonetheless, this decision was made. And this is, I think, a good example of, of how, um, no, of a very even intentional deviation for um, from cost optimization for something that we would typically not include in the models. And of course, decisions like that to anticipate them for the future is, is practically unrealistic, right? Um, then one could also ask, so I showed you the deterministic case, one could also ask that um, perhaps these input parameters are not, were not very precise. So the historical data that I used were not really precise. So here uh, I have conducted also 500 Monte Carlo runs only always looking at the cost optimal scenario. And actually what you can see here, so taking example of one um, discount rate that uh, even with these 500 Monte Carlo runs there's not a single scenario that would have no deviation from a cost optimal scenario. And we always go for, you know, at least above 12% uh, case. And here it's, it's in this, in basically the same case for this 8% uh, discount rate. So that's why what we now, um, so we know that this cost optimization now for, for, for the types of, energy transition that we model may, may be, how to say, um, consistently biased just for its uh, model formulation or its assumption of, of cost optimization. So what we do here then now we are trying to overcome this, uh, this issue by also looking at near optimal scenarios. And again, using this retrospective model, retrospective data to, um, to assess that. And in the expanse, we, we always use a technique called modeling to generate alternatives, which means that we assume a certain slack, which means assume certain maximum deviation possible from the total system cost. And then within that, that range between the cost optimal and, and um, the slack, we look from, um, so in this case, 500 scenarios that we call near optimal scenarios to understand this near optimal space. And I think this is meaningful because it's, you know, the, so on the one hand, we know the reality is likely not cost optimal, but it's also very likely not following the most expensive path. So that's why we, um, we uh, focus on this area of, of uh, near uh, optimality. And now in this case, it's again, only about deterministic run. And I will briefly would like to show how this modeling to generate alternative works. Um, so imagine if we have a very simple system with four technologies, if we add all the model constraints like supply demand or resource constraints or anything like that, we would get a space, um, a constraint uh, space. It's not a cube in, in, in real models. This is just a, 
um, uh, simplification, but it basically shows all kinds of combinations of these technologies that meet the, the model constraints. If we use cost optimization, we represent the space only with one cost optimal uh, scenario. Um, however, then when you're using this modeling to generate alternatives, uh, space we assume the slack so we are interested in also other scenarios that are up to let's say 20 percent more expensive than the cost optimal uh, scenario we slice the space and this is this near optimal space meaning that we exclude more expensive model solutions but focus on on this near optimal space and then by using, so in our case, efficient random generation technique of, of modeling to generate alternatives, we can then choose the, um, you know, a large number of scenarios from this, from this space to, to represent it. Um, and then one, one of the ways, because there are many scenarios, so here you can see we, we choose 500. One of the ways would be to uh, select a number of maximally different scenarios, so a small set of, of maximally different scenarios. And I will go not go here into methodological details, but the methods are described in, in this, um, excuse me, in, in the paper itself. But the result would be something like that. And I so here we have still the cost optimal scenario and this real world transition as I just uh, showed before. And then now in the space of up to 23% higher system costs, we also, for example, would could have found a scenario with lots of coal. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's also would have been in this range of near optimal scenarios. There could have been also a scenario with lots of oil for, for electricity generation together with wind. So as you see here, actually, we already have some in, in contrast to cost optimal scenario, we already can identify that wind power might play a, a role. And of course we cannot, you know, get a complete composition of, of this scenario. Uh, it's, well, it's, it's a very small chance to, to get that exactly in a scenario, but at least we can better I see the potential low role of these technologies. We could have also gotten a scenario with more growth of combined gas turbines. So that actually also would, would uh, something we, we can we have seen in reality. We could have also gotten a scenario with more hydro, uh, so excuse me, wind onshore and offshore power. And this is quite an ambitious scenario, but it's already see at least it goes in the direction of the real world transition rather than this cost optimal scenario and then so on and so forth so one can really find various alternatives that are in this near optimal space um, since it's many scenarios one can also analyze patterns and you know all, among all these 500 scenarios and that is for example here just a depiction in terms of box plots and what you can see, so if we look at the year for the year 2010 in, term, in terms of installed capacity, it in particular becomes interesting for renewable technologies like wind and solar, because we see that the cost optimal scenario actually would consistently underestimate them as compared to what has happened in reality. So the red uh, circles here, but by looking at these near optimal scenarios, we can actually have a range of, of scenarios that encapsulate, so to say, this real world development. So they do not uh, so systematically, um, you know, some scenarios still have less, less wind than, than in the real world, of course, but at least the kind of, so to say, uncertainty bound is big enough to also consider these, uh, these technologies. And here it's this uh, something similar we observe also, for example, for gas combined cycle turbines. And you know, in the 90s, that was the also the novel and more, more expensive technology. And again, in cost optimal scenario, it, it was uh, underestimated as, as compared to the real world situation. But by using this modeling to generate alternatives, we would actually have broad enough range of 
solutions to anticipate this, um, that this could potentially uh, happen as well. Now, one can also look, you know, what would happen if we use um, modeling to generate alternatives in combination with Monte Carlo runs. So that, of course, ends up in, in very large um, kind of number of, of scenarios. And here I will show just one example of depicting cumulative greenhouse gas emissions. So that's, again, in a way represents part of the technology mix. Um, in, in, uh, and what we can see here is that if we look only at cost optimal scenarios in black, um, even if we do such an extensive Monte Carlo simulation and only look at cost optimal scenarios, we would not, to some extent, but not fully cover the real world uh, transition, right? So that means that sometimes, you know, all the work on getting the parameters as, as you know, as accurately as possible, and then um, doing extensive uncertainty analysis, parametric uncertainty analysis, actually may not uh, fully um, overcome this this limitation of of um, you know structural model uh, model uh, uh, bias. And here then uh, also it's shown that if the, the gray scenarios here now combine both uh, scenarios of modeling to generate alternatives and on parametric uncertainty, so and Monte Carlo run, and that in that sense, they are much better in encapsulating this, uh, the red, the real world transition. But of course, that means they also show a much broader uncertainties as compared to, to um, to only a cost optimization model, which is, uh, well, and this is of course a challenge on, on its own to, to work with these large uncertainties. Um, so yeah, so basically th this was an example to, to illustrate how the, this historical simulation approach can help to identify the limitation of the model, but also find a way to, to improve it and to uh, overcome it. So in this case, by using modeling to generate alternatives. And so actually in our group, uh, how do you say, after this study, we have, we never run our models only in a cost optimization uh, application because it's, you know, it's always in, in modeling to generate alternatives uh, approach because that's, that's what, what this historical simulation has, has taught us. And just to show, you know, this was the case of the UK, one can also um, here, you know, apply it in, in different uh, settings. So um, I just mentioned here it very briefly. So this is about spatial growth of renewable electricity generation in Switzerland. So it's a, another country. And uh, what we have here is the, the scenario that would kind of extends the current spatial trends where a new solar PV and wind and other technologies grow in terms of um, installed capacity per capita. And actually, again, if we would have, you know, if we would just simply model that in the year for the year 2035 with the cost optimization, we would get, get a very actual pattern to anything that we observe um, that we observe today, and that that again shows how how um, potentially biased and limited this least cost scenario is when it comes to to real world dynamics. And also, you know, in in many of the renewable energy system or spatial models, sometimes also the growth of of the different technologies is assumed to be equal. So that's something that we have here, a so-called maximal uh, regional equity scenario. So where all regions build at a similar rate new technologies, given their potentials, of course. And again, we see that the, the reality is, is very different. So that's why by modeling this, um, you know, through historical modeling and so on, one can find how, how to tweak these types of either cost optimization or this more equal growth uh, models to, to match the, the pattern better, to match the reality better. 
Um, so yeah, so I said I focused mostly on historical simulations, but of course, um, a robust validation of, of model needs multiple methods. And, um, and again, I just invite you to, to look at this um, framework by, by Charlie Wilson and, and colleagues, because there they explain also the, the other types of methods. And to finish, I would like to, um, so this is, since this is the engaged capacity building session, I would like to um, draw your attention to two other pro, uh, products from the Navigate project. So Navigate is a, in a way, a sister project of Engage. And just last year, we had this uh, workshop of experts and stakeholders on model robustness and legitimacy. And that also included a survey on what is important, and what methods are available um, when it comes to improving robustness of models and the answers of both experts as well as stakeholders, so meaning stakeholders, intended users and policy and so on. So if you look either on our website or, or just Google with, with this name, you will find the report uh, publicly available online. And you can uh, look up this um, survey data in, in that report. And then the other um, topic that I have not yet touched here but also improving the models uh, by including, you know, so to, to take into account this, these deviations from um, cost optimality, one of the pathways is to include more insights from social sciences um, that could explain why these kind of deviations and help more model them. And among them, there's also the one of the aspect of feasibility that that limits perhaps some of the actual implementation of cost optimal scenarios leading to reality being near optimal. So with the Navigate colleagues here, we have also uh, worked to um, envision how some of these, you know, what are the good practice examples of trying to include these social science insights into models, but also what it means for the model um, evaluation and uh, again for example this historical approach uh, comes up so that's all that that i had thanks for for listening here are my contact details if you would um if you would like to to follow it up and otherwise i wish you a productive um, capacity building workshop ciao